We've got to do, we've got to do an introduction and everything right. again. Hello! Here we are again. This is the next instalment of our Games and History, History and Games podcast, videocast, vlog. What is it? We don't know. It doesn't matter. Recorded chit chat. That's it. Recorded chit chat. Official title. Uh, here we are. My name is John Hodgson. I own and run a little games company called Handiwork Games. We're based in Falkirk in Scotland. And we make a lot of games that are inspired by history, historical themes, stuff from the olden days and I'm joined today by... I'm Malcolm Craig, I'm Senior Lecturer in American History at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK and also sometime role-playing games designer and kibitzer with handiwork games and stuff that they produce. So between us, I'll keep this shorter, every, every episode this bit's going to get shorter, between us we have a really interesting mix of sort of skills and experience in both as uh, a professional historian, a professional game maker, and a sort of amateur historian and a part-time game maker. You know, between us, I think we've got some interesting perspectives. Uh, we have delivered a talk in a couple of times uh, about games in history and history in games, and we thought it was a nice idea to sort of bring it to a wider audience. It's never been recorded, and we realized if we're gonna start recording it, it doesn't need to be an hour long and Q&A and all that. It can be just this rambling chit chat about these themes, which is cool indeed and in the last one i think we ended by reflecting on the the scientific changes to our understanding of history particularly the role of kind of understanding mitochondrial dna in changing our understanding of deep history of human migration of all of these kind of things i thought that might be a good starting point yeah. Yeah. to get us uh, get us thinking uh, there because it's really interesting how i mean certainly with the sort of mitochondrial dna stuff that it mitochondrial DNA. I'm trying to, I'm sort of like skipping over that word to not have to pronounce it properly. I just so it's okay. I spent like over a decade of my academic career researching nuclear non-proliferation and I <laughs> still struggle to pronounce it's nuclear non-proliferation. It's a nightmare. That's why that's why I'm now studying role-playing games <laughs> in history in the Cold War because I can't pronounce my original field of study. <laughs> It's, it's funny. Well, I mean, there's that classic thing, isn't it, that you should never criticise someone who pronounces a name, you know, word wrongly because it's very like they've only ever read it in a book, and you know, and that's to be applauded because they've just read it in a book. They've never sp seen it spoken at earlier. Yeah, spoken. exactly. Yeah. And you go, yeah, okay. Anyway, sorry, that yeah. was just a massive interruption. That's yeah, right. That's all part of it. Well, it's yeah. nice to empower people. Just say whatever you like. It doesn't yeah, matter. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA has sort of been a bit of a revolution in um, sort of archaeology and yeah, tracing the, the, the history of humanity, really. But it, it, it is a very recent thing in, in broad terms and has caused a lot of research to have to be looked at again and some things that were thought about, you know, really ancient times still hold true and some things don't. Um, and yet, I mean, one really obvious thing I'll just jump straight into, into it, um, is the discovery that the first people in the British Isles are very likely to have had uh, dark skin. Blue or green eyes, which I think is really fascinating. Mm. I made a mistake. I was interviewed once and I said, oh, so that's completely unlike uh, any present day culture, which is completely untrue. And I was really embarrassed because it's just like not true. Oh, um, so you've not done the reading? I had not done the reading. Ah. See our previous episode for that. Um, but it's a really interesting thing that, that I don't think anyone really knew this. How would they know without, you know, mm. DNA evidence that, that points to these things? And and as far as, in my, I'm no expert on this, but in my understanding, in my reading, it's not 100% certain exactly how the this genetic material would have manifested itself, but it's very likely that the sort of Mesolithic people, the Middle Stone Age people that, that um, moved into the British Isles from Dogland and mainland Europe... Uh, were dark skinned with blue eyes, green eyes. Um, and it's quite interesting when we talk about shifts in sort of historical research and stuff, the reactions to that I think are really quite interesting. I mean, that was something I was, I, I was actually gonna, going to ask you because, I mean, again, I keep coming away with these banal truisms <laughs> that, you know, that history is always moderated through the lens of the present. And the reactions to 
these archaeological mm. and scientific discoveries of the the skin colour yeah. of the earliest people who settled in what yeah. is now Britain have been interesting yes. to say the least. And again, I think that is filtering the past through very contemporary lenses. It, it is very interesting because you see a range of reactions. Like this, this my encounter with this was I was doing the reading for our game Mask Witches of Forgotten Dogland that's all about the people in Dogland and it struck me from reading in various sources it was very likely that everyone that appeared in our game would be dark skinned. Light skin does not make it to that area in the period that we're in, it does a bit later. Um, and of course, you know, we started making artwork that reflected that and talking about it because I just think it's a, to me it's just an interesting fact. I will confess I'm a little bit naughty about it because I find it quite amusing at the sort of people that will be annoyed by that who have a sort of simplistic view of of perhaps present day sort of nationalism or what have you, you know. But it is very interesting that some people embrace it and sort of love it and some people want to kind of equivocate around, oh, but not, you know, dark-skinned, but not like dark-skinned people now. <laughs> like, and you know, but... What? <laughs> like this is really I mean the whole I mean the whole sort of when you look into this kind of thing and you read around it, the concept of sort of race as a genetic mm. kind of thing, the wheels just fall off all of this because these people in deep history are a completely different culture to completely unrelated culturally to us as far as we know. I mean, I would be very surprised if there's any, you know, commonality there and culturally. Um but yeah, people's reactions to these sort of emerging new facts are fascinating to watch. Really interesting stuff. And then it's fascinating to watch your own reaction to it. You know, I've you can tell perhaps, hopefully it comes across that I've spent a bit of time thinking about it, mm. that it does sort of fill me with glee. Of course <laughs> Which, it does. You know, and I don't want to... God, and, you know, you could really accuse me of sort of tourist in a really serious issue here, you know, for if your day-to-day -day experience is suffering racism because you have a different skin colour than some other people that you meet. That's not funny. You know? But, it, I mean, it, it bespeaks a kind of... I think in many situations, especially if we're taking, like, the, you know, Britain as, as an example, that the investment in the idea of, throughout history, Europe, yes. as a kind of, like, monolithically white part of the world that, that that whiteness has been yeah. a constant and you're like well you clearly don't understand the history of whiteness you need to go away and yes. do some reading on how that that idea was conceptualized and how you know do the reading, well, right? do the re I mean I, I mean I was I think I've always really loved since since I first read it Nell Irvin Painter's book A History of White People yeah. which goes I mean it, the main focus of the book is on uh, kind of later period, the United mm -hmm. States in the kind of 18th, 19th and 20th century and everything. But I think it's great the, the way she articulates the way that, you know, the idea of whiteness was conceptualised from antiquity onwards and the malleability and changeability of it is really... That's a book I would definitely recommend. Yeah, I, like the first chapter, if you only read the first chapter, it yes. really yeah, makes yeah. you think. And I think there's, that's the takeaway from it about who who is the sort of in-group, you know, and who mm. is the... Because they talk about, hey, here's a word that I don't think I've ever said out loud, like the Scythians or the Scythians. Or the yeah, I'm, I never know quite how to pronounce it. Is it Scythians, Scythians, Scythians? Yeah. Scythians? I think there's a lot yes. of that. That's the pronunciation of yeah. C's and K's yeah, and yeah, spellings yeah. with C's and K's. That changes quite a lot, you mm. know. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and ideas of, like, you know, what constitutes beauty. Yes. You know, what yes. constitutes the ideal in all the, 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 that, how where everything's rooted in that. Yeah. It's a fascinating book. I would heartily recommend getting getting hold of a copy. It is really interesting. And this does relate to gaming. I think, yes. you know, yeah, I yeah. would utterly forgive you if you're watching this going, what has this got to do? Okay, this is just cultural studies stuff. But it is to do with the ideas we bring. When we try and make a game about history, it is once again about examining your own ideas about what history is or what anything is you know it starts to become really important to think about those things what why are you doing this you know why are you making a game and what is your point you know in doing so? yeah there's often reactions to kind of 
you know, in historically informed, you know, people will often raise the objection, well, that's not historically accurate. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, on one hand, we're dealing with a fantasy here, in the broader, broader sense, but also oftentimes what people are saying isn't histori accurate, historically accurate, actually is. Right. Or they're using certain things to you know, to excuse certain behaviours within the setting of the game and saying, oh, this is historically accurate, that, you know, my character can do this because... And I'm like, that's... I find that deeply problematic. We're, go we're way off... We're going way off in a kind of different direction uh, here. It is, it, yeah, no, it is really funny about... Again, I could think... The things people bring to it, it is like that, that old chestnut about... In the past, eight, say the Middle Ages, everyone—it's just blood and mud and yeah, yeah, sickness, yeah. and all, and and every everything is awful, and nothing is happy, and you know you wouldn't want to live there, and people are just killing each other constantly. You know, it's just anarchy throughout. Now, you can't deny <laughs> that this is a pretty rough time to live, in comparison to the relative paradise that we in you know our part of the world happen to enjoy. However, I think there is, you could make an argument that there are places in the Middle Ages that are sort of colourful, happy, successful, mm. and so on. In, you know, in Europe, I'm talking about, you know, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not being very clear on that. Um, and you could, if you set out to make a sort of Game of Thrones, grim, dark game and say it's historically accurate, you're just painting with such a broad brush. There's nonsense, you know, it's yeah. just rubbish, it's just silly. But... You might have fun with that, and it might be cool, and it might be what you want to do. And certainly George R. R. Martin, you know, that's what he set out to do, to make this, and he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, and it's that's the, the sort of the entertainment of what he's doing. But it's, I think it's smart to be knowing about it um, and not just, assume, you know, common, again, common sense assumptions, you know, are dangerous things. Um, and I think you might miss some good stuff if you come in with too many assumptions. Yeah. But that's changes, isn't it? I mean, this this the idea of because what we're trying to talk about on this episode is sort of responses to changes in mm. understanding of things, and there is that resistance to that perhaps some of the Middle Ages was all right, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> as long as you you know, as long as you don't mind uh, dying of toothache. <laughs> Yep, age twenty-one. Yeah, it was pretty good up until that moment. No, yeah, it's very quite complicated to talk about that in any broad sense you know i think there's, there's just it's all a bit more detail perhaps than common sense would have us think but i mean this this kind of takes us back to that i mean one of the things we've been talking about with you talking about mitochondrial dna and the way it's changed our understanding of deeper history is the importance of acknowledging the you know the way that historiography and by that i mean the what historians write uh without you know i don't want to keep saying historiography all the time people what are you banging on about malcolm um Change it. I mean, it's the, the importance of understanding that the, the scholarship changes a yes. lot over time, and it's important if you are if you are indeed striving for historical accuracy or you want to m create a historically informed game that has at least some nod towards what actually happened or peoples and their cultures mm. and societies and everything, is not just to rely on older works oh i've got this book from 1995 great that'll that'll do me fine there is a lot of change in my own field within the cold war mm. there's been massive changes over the past say let's say 30 years because of the end of the cold war i mean that's one of the main things that, that opened up so many uh archives in you know the former soviet union in eastern europe uh but there's certainly kind of you know areas where we you know, still don't have you know, a huge amount of access to. There's a lot of, you know, for example, v Vietnamese mm. archives that scholars have had very little access to. Right. But then, you know, others, you know, some scholars have gained access. Uh, Lane Hang Nguyen's book, Hanoi's War, in 2014. I'm just referencing it because I was just reading it recently yeah. or revising it for a, a class. She had access to really important uh, Vietnamese government archives from the north during the, the conflict. The, the Vietnam War, if you want to call it that, the Resistance War for Freedom and National Liberation, called many different things by different people. And her account of this, in 2014, presents a radically different view of the Northern Communist perspective on the conflict in that part of the world. 
Because I love than it. A kind of, than a, kind of a US centric focus on it. Because I was going to ask. What I've realised is quite a, a, a question of a certain type. I was going to go, so is the information there? You know, is the, you know, is the, there are archives in, you know, in sort of, you know, I don't know anything about it. But but I've realised that's sort of a stupid question. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, did those people keep <laughs> records? Could be. I didn't yeah. quite mean that. But no, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I understand. Well, I mean, this is. I mean, this is one of the you know the problems is that kind of you know an archive is a curated collection of stuff. Right. People you know decide what's going in there. Uh, but there's always new stuff being declassified, you know, changes in understanding, you know, revisiting old, mm -hmm. you know, topics with fresh eyes and thinking, oh. Yeah. This actually, the way it was thought about here is different. There's, I mean, there's never going to be a smoking gun right. that's going to radic, you know, that's going to go. This is the one document that will completely change our understanding of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, for example, you know, we all know, you know that the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, had a positive outcome because of luck. Right. You know, it's and, luck, and so look, the historian uh, Benoit Palopadas, as his he, uh, his definition of luck in the Cuban Missile Crisis is, and I really apologise to Benoit if I mangle his his kind of thing. Uh, he's a lovely guy. Uh, is that a positive outcome in a situation where there is no overall control? Right. That's okay. the definition yeah. of luck. And the Cuban Missile Crisis to use an important cold because that's the the root point for hot war is that the Cuban Missile Crisis goes wrong. Right. Yes. Okay. And in hot war, this is very much in the background, is that it goes wrong because of luck. Right. Okay. You know, it's like yeah, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pe people lower down the chain making decisions that lead to a nuclear conflict, but it didn't happen like that in our real real world because of positive outcomes in situations where Kennedy or Khrushchev had zero control over what was happening further down the ladder. And it's blind luck. Whereas there was an immense amount of work written, you know, like, you know, God, Graham Allison's Essence of Decision back in 1971, you know, about the role of Kennedy's leadership, about important, mm -hmm. Kennedy, Kennedy, it was Kennedy's leadership that won the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's like, and then you look at stuff that's come out since the 90s and you're like, no, we were lucky not to all be fried into cinders, you know, in that period in human history. So are you finding with, in revisiting Hot War and Cold City, are you updating the sort of historical research that you... Very much so. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Uh, you know, there's a lot in there that, uh, I mean, that I read on an amateur basis, mm -hmm. but now having... You know, moved into academia and become a professional historian. Uh, I've delved into a lot more recent scholarship, so there's definitely stuff in there that I want to, uh, you know, try and even down to the level of how the British government planned for the onset of nuclear war. Okay. Yeah. In the 1950s and 1960s, there's been a lot more work done on that since Hot War came out, which I think will help nuance in really interesting ways the setting and the background of the game. Not in a heavy handed way, but just to give these interesting little takes well, on it. That's quite fascinating for people that are aware of the first edition. Yes. When we, you know, put out the second edition to see what's changed and why. And I'm, I'm pretty sure we will be, you know, there will be footnotes talking oh, yes. about this, you yeah, know, yeah. about what, what has changed and why and why things are the way they are within that. And I think it'll be, I mean, it'll be quite subtle because it's not kind of completely rewritten our understanding. Uh, of, of what has, you know, what has happened. But, you know, to give you a good example uh, of how, you know, declassification can lead to change. Mm -hmm. There was in the, in the aftermath of the kind of the creation of the first thermonuclear, the, you know, deliverable thermonuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So in 1954, the US has the Castle series in the Pacific uh, and they test a deliverable hydrogen bomb. And these are weapons of limitless destruction. An atom bomb you can only make so big, okay? Whereas with a hydrogen bomb, you give it enough fuel, you can make it as big, powerful as you want. Anyway, so the, the thermonuclear bomb comes along in 1954 in the deliverable sense. So in 55, uh, the British government, Churchill and Eden at this point, go, right, we need to understand how this is going to affect Britain. What if Britain is subject to a thermonuclear attack? So they, uh, they set up a committee under this guy called Dr. William Strath. I hope I get Strath's first name right. I think it's William. Uh, and the Strath Committee comes back in late 1955, which, with something which is called, rather unimaginatively, the Strath Report. Now, what the Strath Report says 
is that Britain is hit down the west coast, so in a line up the west coast of Britain, by 10 thermonuclear bombs of a reasonable size, about a megaton or so, that's it. Hi, so this is future Malcolm in my office rather than the handy studio. Just a quick note to say, my memory was wrong when it came to the Strath Report. It was commissioned in late 1954, it arrived on the desks of government in March 1955, and the 10 bombs that they were talking about drop, being dropped uh, up the coast of Britain were actually 10 megatons each, according to the report. Fallibility of historical memory. Britain is dead. British society and government is gone. We cease to be a functioning society. And the Strath Report was so terrifying to the government that it was kept classified to, I think, 2003, 2004. So even well after the Cold War, the Strath Report was still classified. So when it was, I mean, everyone knew that this thing existed. But when you actually read the, and the document is terrifying because it's incredibly matter of fact and it's very <laughs> succinct and you can see why they were like, we can't let the public read this stuff. Uh, but when you actually read it, it's really interesting. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that can change your understanding of, mm. you know, how people in positions of power are thinking about the most destructive weapons ever created and what they might do to societies. Was there, do you think there was a, because I know I, I'm interested in how certain information is restricted from the general public, mm. because either it would, in the obvious sense, it would cause panic or sort of utter depression and despondency, and you know people would lose any sense of meaning in life and so on. But do you think there's a? I mean, God, I'm just asking really difficult questions. Sometimes I wonder if there's, it's like evidence of massive change being possible is withheld from people so it's like no life's like this life goes like this you know you well from cradle to grave stuff you know is important that, that there is a plan for people and our society supports that plan and and it, it can't really survive that level of potential Class change. classification is always in the service of contemporary political concerns right always always yeah. one of the concerns so if you read the documents alongside the strath report they were terrified that the publication of this could lead to wider membership of organisations that promoted disarmament. Right. Oh, okay. That it could yeah, reduce, yeah, yeah. reduce the horrific. public's confidence in Britain being a nuclear deterrent power and therefore yeah. Britain's position within the Cold War system would be, would be destroyed. So they were, they were worried about this creating a massive public sea change in opinion that could really radically alter Britain's position in the world. So that's one, but yeah, it's always about dictating the public vision of history. Yeah. That, you know, this comes, you know, a good example of it is, you know, the, the way that we kind of mythology, the British Empire is frequently mythologised. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is there was a deliberate process during decolonisation of the destruction of archives, the sequestering of archives. You know, there's all the stuff about the the Malmo that was discovered at the, <laughs> the secret depository at Hanslow Park. I was reading about this recently, where yeah. and like you know, even like the term Mau Mau is just like a made up scary yeah. word because they were talking about it because. King Charles is off there yeah, now. Yeah, and yeah. The, the BBC News was talking about Mau Mau. And you go, but we know it's a made up yeah. word. The people that were doing that, like rebellion, that, were, didn't call themselves and that. And that was a deliberate <laughs> process of making the end of empire look palatable. Yeah. I that mean, it, you know, that it, it wasn't this kind of, you know, oh, it wasn't like, you know, France and Indochina or Algeria. Yeah. We were actually okay. Our wasn't a violent end. I'm like, well, if you look at part the partition of British India in 1947, yeah, well, it's pretty, yeah, you know, million people or so die as a result of partition, and it sets up you know, the situation we have today. I, th I thought it was really interesting with um, the death of Queen Elizabeth II that a lot came out about the royal family's interest in oil mm. and the way with decolonisation that, that certain assets were reserved by the royal family abroad, you know, the, the part of the deals made and so on. Um, it's one of the things we don't have access to is yeah. royal records. Yeah. Historians are always talking about this. The royal family are exempt from freedom of, inform from freedom of information. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we simply do not have access to. I think it's really interesting because 
I mean, much of this is, I just think it's really interesting. <laughs> and like, I don't care if it's to do with games yeah. or not. Um, but it's where you find spaces to, to make game stuff as well. You know, yes, where you can yeah. go, what if, what if, and you know, what, what, you know, yeah. Uh, but that's, I mean, that kind of, you know, hot war is based on the classic what if that's been yes. done many times before of what if the Cuban Missile Crisis goes goes wrong? Yeah. What if luck doesn't hold? What's the result of that? And what will... I mean, my interest with uh, with Hot War is kind of like, what will... What would British society be like mm. if we can like, do the reading about what it was like and what governments would do in these situations? What is British society after a nuclear war going to be like? And how would people behave and react? And what are the structures that are in place? What is governments? I mean, my idea of it is fairly cynical. Mm-hmm. That in hot war, the British government is borderline fascist. Right. That you know, refugees from the continent are being put into massive camps mm-hmm. on the English coast. There's all sorts of chaos and terror going on. I think it's a fairly cynical view of what you know, Britain, you know, Britain can take it. No, 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 Britain absolutely can't take it. It's also almost the kind of the anti-blitz spirit kind of thing. We're gonna we're gonna become what we hate, uh, kind of thing. So it's almost like kind of like a cynical understanding of it. But that in itself is based on my reading of actual government materials mm-hmm. on on what do we do in the event. And some you know war plans were saying, okay, so the, one of the things we need to do to keep control is we bring back, and they explicitly say this, I can't remember the exact document, uh, medieval punishments. Bring back the stocks, right. uh, bring back public hanging, and bring back flogging. It's remarkable that it was someone's job to sort of work this stuff out, you know, and, and I don't care to put myself in a position of going, oh, no, that's bad, you know, if there's been a nuclear war mm. or limited nuclear exchange... I don't know what's right and wrong. Yeah. I haven't spent any time, you know, ever thinking about it. But it's quite remarkable when you look at the work of people who did and you go, what? And, and you wonder what their, where they were coming from, you know, what their basis for these conclusions were. And there's also, that I came across, this was a document from the 70s about what would happen if, like, London is severely hit. And there's one civil servant talking about refugees streaming out of London mm-hmm. and this entire series of, like, missives back and forth refers to the, the people coming out of London as a result of a nuclear strike as zombies. They use the word zombies is, deli- is, is used and isn't I was it, found it, that fascinating. Amazing that you would sort of become suddenly re- internal refugees. Yes. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Suddenly your status as a formerly, you know, citizen of the country is almost revoked by this enormous act of violence, you know, mm blasts you into being talked about as a zombie or a refugee. It's like, wow. Yeah, because there's going to be no central government. It's going to be devolved local control to regional governments, to military governors, all these kind of things. It's, yeah, all of this stuff is, this is the kind of stuff that feeds into hot war. It's all quite and upsetting, it's, isn't it's it? Really, it's, it's horror. <laughs> it is, you know, you, there's, there's a great book uh, written by the historian uh, Peter Hennessy called The Secret State. The second edition is the one to get because that's the one that was written after the Strath Report was declassified. Oh, okay, right. And uh, again, lovely Peter Hennessy, lovely guy, a great historian, a uh, very thoughtful individual. And The Secret State is great on this kind of, how does how did Britain prepare for the worst? Yeah. What's the, the ultimate logic of the Cold War is planetary annihilation. So how did the British government prepare for this? And again, it's a fascinating book that goes into a lot of detail about the about the plans and the ideas and the thinking that went into all this stuff. Definitely, I would, if you're interested in this, I would definitely recommend reading it. It's still a really great book. <laughs> it's, it's like, how does, how does it happen, this is a facile question, that you come across something like Dungeons and Dragons, it's like sort of Ren Fair, people in sort of dagged clothing and using talking like Thor, and you go, no, we won't do that. What <laughs> the sort of game we're going to play is about the, what the British government was going to do if there was a nuclear war. It's it's a reaction to Twilight Two Thousand. Oh uh, yeah. Oh okay. Yes. Of course. Of course. This is this is perhaps a future conversation, but yeah. Hot War is. An almost direct reaction to my experiences playing Twilight 2000 in the 1980s and 1990s. I had a very negative experience playing that, which I can hand on heart say is nothing to do with the content of the game, regardless of what that content may, may or may not be. But I played with some horrible people at school. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, what was I going to say? 
Have you read the new one yet? I know you picked up the new Twilight 2000 at UK Games Expo, was it? Yes, I did. I've not had a chance to skim it okay. in anything more than a, a very a very surface level flick through. It's in my uh, research pile. I've been concentrating because of my current research, mm -hmm. going through old Twilight 2000 supplements, yeah, yeah. particularly the Going Home series when they've you know when they've gone back when they've gone back to the United States. This is part of my kind of argument about Twilight 2000, about the parochial concerns that it presents. Uh, but so I've been going through that at the moment as part of my research and trying to write up an article on this. But I certainly think that the the way that it is presented as a now alternative history mm -hmm. game and the way that history is developed through the game looks on the surface level very, very interesting. Uh, it's certainly a... I mean, the box weighs a ton. There's so much <laughs> compared to. I've got my first edition, Twilight 2000, second edition, and then this the free league one, yeah. and the the box is like a ton weight. The so, you open it and everything explodes out in a small mushroom cloud. There's so much stuff in there. There's cards. There's maps. There's tokens. There's dice. There's everything in it. Is it just a lot of saying? Is it like. It's not cool, this saying. It's not actually fun. Because it always struck me that the first one's a bit like, this would actually be great. <laughs> like, you know, then we'd be off the leash. Well, I mean, one of the, the explicit reasons that Twilight 2000 was, was created was because the people like Frank Chadwick mm -hmm. and everything like GDW, Lord and Wiseman, uh, all of them, they saw a gap in the market. They were looking to create an explicitly military uh, mm -hmm. role-playing game that they felt hadn't been served well by earlier titles like Recon and Merc and stuff like that. Uh, so on one hand, it is that the setting is post-apocalypse. Part of it was this desire to tap into a segment of the role-playing games market, the desire to play more contemporary military settings. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? I can talk more, once I've completed my article, I can I can talk about this in more detail. <laughs> it's very good. You know, we're coming up to time and I think that's right, great. a great place to stop. Fascinating stuff. Wow. I need to go and lie down now. I've been thinking about. It. Yeah, I can. I can move from the handy couch now. I've kind yeah. of. Uh, I think my thighs have gone to sleep. You can cut that bit out. No one needs to hear that. No one needs to hear that.